Um, I'm very pleased to be here in this spectacular country and um, honored to represent the Department of Energy here today. So during my talk, um, I'm going to share with you some thoughts on the relationship between policy, um, technology development, and innovation. And it couldn't have it couldn't follow better um, from your, your your discussion earlier on what's happening um, in Europe. So I, I'd also like to just give an overview briefly um, of what's happening, the exciting initiatives that are underway within the Geothermal Technologies Office at Department of Energy. So the policies and initiatives that I'm going to, to talk about today in concert really do show commitment across the federal government to promote and facilitate clean energy technology development and, and really a holistic attempt to address what a, one of the most defining challenges essentially of our time, which was discussed you know, quite articulately um, yesterday at the, at the uh, plenary session, which is clean energy and, and climate. So first, I'll give you a little bit of context in terms of um, where I work, the, the US Department of Energy's Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy. The renewable sector of that office is divided into four technology areas, solar, wind, water, and geothermal. And across those offices, we advance energy science and technology um, from the basic science area to uh, technology deployment. We fund cutting edge transformational research and development on clean energy. And we hopefully try to set that up so the private sector can ultimately adapt and adopt and, and ultimately scale it up. And in, in addition to technology R&D, we also work to invest in uh, market barriers. So transmission, um, commercialization issues, analysis associated, anything that um, will help advance the adoption of the technologies that, that we develop. So in, in our fiscal year 16, the budget combined budget of this, this office is $478 million. And I'll ask you to keep that number in mind later when I come back to some budgets um, associated with, with our specific program. So uh, I'll go swiftly through some, some information just about the, the US renewable energy landscape. Here you can see um, the US all of the above energy mix, which is the policy that our administration supports and pursues. For context, this is just a breakdown by nameplate capacity of um, the 1,158 gigawatts currently installed nameplate capacity. Of that, 180 gigawatts is 15% um, is comprised of renewable capacity. And in the US presently, um, based on 2014 data that's shown here, 0.3% um, of that 180 gigawatts comes from geothermal. So significant improvements we've heard today, yesterday, have been made in um, deployment of wind and solar over the last decade. We've seen between 2008 and, and 2012 alone um, increases in wind on the order of doubling. Solar has increased 20-fold. And, and despite knowing that the geothermal resource in the United States is vast, um, over one, 100 to 500 gigawatts for EGS potential, potentially uh, 30 gigawatts of undiscovered hydrothermal resource, we've seen very little growth in the last decade compared to these other renewable technologies. So we have about 3.7 gigawatts of installed nameplate capacity online right now in the US. And at the end of 2015, 2.7 gigawatts of um, actual net generation. In, in 2015, 70 megawatts came online in the state of Nevada, um, and that was via two plant expansions. And we had 1,250 megawatts that, were, that are, are sort of in development at this point. So why are we so stagnant? We've heard this from other, other areas as well. Um, a recent study by one of our national laboratories uh, indicates that that of the projects that they discuss, they, they spoke to and tried to understand what was you know what the stagnation was related to that um, mostly we're talking about market barriers so issues with permitting issues with financing which we heard a lot about yesterday um, slow very slow permitting process processes, um, the inability to receive power purchase agreements. And in fact, half a gigawatt of that power, of the power that's waiting to come online, is stagnant because of the inability to receive a power purchase agreement right now. So also hindering the US industry, uh, very low natural gas prices, everyone is aware of that. And, and I would say more holistically, most of the, the um, low hanging fruit, as they say, or the, the um, easy to develop hydrothermal resources have already been developed, they've been identified, and so the, the resources that are out there now present much greater risk um, for exploration and drilling. So successful clean energy, 
just as, as we just heard and have heard over the last two days. Um, but solutions really rely on the interrelation of, of, of three areas, technology and innovation, policy and, and markets. And so I'm going to touch on two pieces of this pie. Essentially, the, the, the role that the US and EERE, my organization's policies, as well as technology and innovation um, play in driving technology development, and then where DOE and our partners fit into um, that innovation space. So when I say policy, what, what I'm talking about um, is, for example, relevant policies that set quantitative and measurable uh, targets for clean energy. And we just heard a lot about that as well. So examples of this would be the White House uh, climate action plan that's set forth um, some targets to increase renewable energy generation and also to reduce greenhouse gases in the United States by 28% over the next decade. Um, also, we have federal R&D investments or appropriations that allow us to invest in science and technology solutions to meet those targets that have been established. And so here, agreements that came out of COP2021, for example, um, represent policy driving R&D investments. 20 countries, including the United States, committed to doubling R&D investments over the next over five years. Another federal policy uh, that was enacted via the Energy Policy Act of 2005 was the development of the Department of Energy's Loan Program Office, which can issue loan guarantees to um, renewable energy projects that are commercial scale um, and are generally high risk. So we all know that financeability of these projects, as we've heard, can be very difficult, can, can impede deployment. And so the risk can be significantly reduced with these loan guarantee opportunities. And, and the Loan Guarantee Office has $40 billion in authority for billion of which, I said billion, is devoted to renewable energy and energy efficiency. So finally, a last example of in terms of policy that I'll give is uh, related to tax incentives. And tax incentives in, uh, obviously encourage energy companies to deploy renewable energy with the promise of a subsidy, a subsidy that essentially can enable cost competitive deployment with other, with other energy technologies. And so the renewable electricity uh, production tax credit here, the federal credit, um, reduces federal income taxes for owners of any sort of renewable generation facilities in the US, and sometimes on the order of 35% of the actual total project cost. So this is quite significant. You can see here, um, unfortunately, in the Appropriations Act of 2016, the geothermal uh, production tax credit was uh, ended after 2016, whereas some other renewable technologies will continue until 2019. And I'll touch back on this a little bit later. So policy making a difference for geothermal. This plot Pat Dobson showed from Lawrence Berkeley yesterday there's a direct correlation between policies and, and megawatts online, nameplate capacity coming online. We have um, federal policies like PURPO, which was enacted back after the, um, the energy policy, the energy crisis in 1973 to bring renewable energy online, did just that. We see a significant jump in, in capacity online. Also federal um, and state R&D incentives, as I mentioned. So field activities, drilling, drilling actual um, actual drilling in the field. For example, the industry coupled drilling program, which you can see early in the 70s, and then the GRED program, which is the geothermal resource exploration drilling program, also significantly impacted the capacity online in the United States. So how can we do this and how can we continue this in the future? Um, what are the opportunities? So some of the, some of the opportunities I've already mentioned, um, existing policies will be impactful, um, but also there may be some things happening in 2016 that could also spur development and, and opportunities for expansion. So just last week, our Senate um, issued a comprehensive energy bill, which is tremendously exciting. Um, it outlines some outstanding policies that, if they're enacted, could actually um, make, a, make a significant impact. So first is our US Geological Survey has been required or asked to, um, if this passes, of course, I have to caveat that, um, to prioritize any sort of sites that could um, could enable development of 50,000 megawatts of geothermal energy. Another, another uh, proposal is that categorical exclusions would be given for exploration activities. And so what that means is that essentially the permitting processes that may take two years for something as simple as a geophysical survey could be done um, in a much shorter time frame and bring us sort of to parity with oil and gas who wasn't actually experiencing these significant delays. And finally, something very interesting, oil and gas wells that are producing a, a significant amount of hot water, in addition to the gas and oil, um, could now actually produce power via co-production from this hot water um, without having to apply for and participate in a competitive leasing process. So that's a significant um, advancement for co-production. 
I mentioned the production tax credit. The opportunity there, we hope, is that we understand that members of Congress are interested in, in um, revisiting that extension and seeing more parity among the renewables going forward. It remains to be seen when those discussions will happen and, and what might happen, but it could have a significant impact for our industry as um, as I mentioned. Also, there's some really great activity happening at the state level. Renewable portfolio standards are, are, are in place in many states. Some are extraordinarily aggressive, 100% um, renewable portfolio standards. And in some states, of course, California, Oregon, Hawaii are very interesting proposals. There are also some other exciting proposals coming from the state's industry coupled drilling or streamlining their permitting processes to reduce the risk of waiting five years for a permit. So really exciting things happening on the state level and potentially on the federal level as well. So I've talked a little bit about federal state incentives or policies and incentives, but I want to bring it back to the Department of Energy and some policies um, within DOE that drive technology development and via setting of targets. And so this is our quadrennial technology review and or QTR. And in this in this document, DOE provides essentially like an assessment of R&D opportunities for the clean energy space. And so in 2015, we had um, five oppor four opportunities were were proposed an outline for the geothermal area. And, and you can see here what those opportunities are. These really align perfectly well with the focus areas of the Geothermal Technologies Office, which I'm representing today, um, which I'll talk about in a minute. But also, um, we, we work under a number of other guiding documents that set targets for us, uh, levelized cost of electricity targets, um, and, and things of that nature, metrics that we seek to follow from our strategic plans and, and so on. So. Um, Moving on to specifically what's happening within our organization. So achieving the energy future that we all desire, that's accessible, that is affordable, reliable, environmentally conscious um, for everyone. Um, we need not only policy, but we also need technology innovation. And that's what we do at the Department of Energy. So we strive to create and to invest in initiatives that will drive geothermal development forward, spur development across the spectrum of geothermal technologies. So I'm going to walk you through sort of the sub-programs that, um, that we work under and then major initiatives there, uh, thereafter. So we have four programs. Enhanced Geothermal Systems, which is the program that I manage, um, represents early stage R&D. Um, we have a large portfolio of research and development projects, as well as five EGS demonstration projects that were successful in showing that EGS is possible and are slowly winding down. But our major initiative right now is called the Frontier Observatory for Research in Geothermal Energy, or FORGE. And this is an EGS-focused subsurface laboratory that's focused on EGS validation, optimization, and reproducible methodologies for creating EGS. Our hydrothermal program is um, is focused on finding the 30 gigawatts of undiscovered resources that I mentioned before that exist in the US. And so key, a key aspect of that is uh, something called play fairway analysis, which we've adopted from the oil and gas industry. And another new initiative in the hydrothermal program also is um, something called the Subter Initiative. We're taking, essentially, combining cross-cutting technologies from other subsurface extraction or just subsurface industries to try and leverage experience and solve common problems. Um, the low temperature program is, um, is moving in a new direction. We traditionally focus on innovative power generation cycles in this program. And now we're working to understand the feasibility of um, additional, essentially additional re revenue streams. So thermal desalination, um, material extraction, and hybrid systems. And then our analysis program finally sort of ties all these subprograms together. We're looking at, um, in, this, in this area, um, comprehensive economic analysis, environmental assessments, and um, data stewardship. And also a, m a major priority in this, in this area is a, our geothermal vision study for the United States that will chart an, an aspirational goal for geothermal development in the future. So I asked you to remember that number of the, of the renewable power budget. 478 million, in case you don't. Um, so now, take a look at our uh, <laughs> our modest budget in the Geothermal Technologies Office. Um, I, although it is it is modest, we are witnessing pretty incredible growth considering um, the political climate in the last two years. So from 14 to 15, we saw an 18% increase in our budget, and from 15 to 16, 25%. And we expect future or hope for future um, increases in the uh, in the coming years. And you can see the breakdown in subprograms. The majority of the increase in funding is is is, um, I'm, I'm glad to say, uh, going towards the Enhanced Geothermal Systems Program, which I'm going to walk you through in a little more detail now. So, FORGE. Um, 
Frontier Observatory for Research in Geothermal Energy. We're looking at EGS optimization, EGS validation. We are thinking, we envision FORGE really as a subsurface field laboratory. So we want the community to be involved in studying how to effectively initiate, create, sustain, and image fracture networks in basement rock formations, which is our focus area for EGS. We're also looking to uh, develop and test and, um, and compare EGS technologies in a very controlled and well-characterized environment. Um, we'll be competitively selecting R&D projects. We'll also be sharing data in as close to real time, so giving the public access not only in physical form, but also in virtual form to this subsurface lab that the taxpayers are, are contributing to. So we also see broad communication and education as a critical goal of this initiative. We feel that FORGE is an opportunity to use essentially as a platform for EGS and geothermal technology literacy um, across the nation and across the globe. It's obviously a significant challenge that uh, many folks don't even understand what geothermal is, and most people don't uh, have never even heard of what EGS is. So back to the 0.3%, we also want to see EGS or see FORGE spur EGS development from our industry and to increase that percentage of, of the renewable energy mix that geothermal can contribute to. So with that context in mind, um, this initiative has been underway for a year. We have five teams that we've selected. You can see them here. Um, it was a very competitive process and we have a really diverse um, and extremely inter interdisciplinary teams that are all bringing very exciting and robust data sets to this problem. And currently in the first phase, which is a year long, they're working to assess all of the characterization data they have on these sites and develop comprehensive geologic models that they'll be presenting to us actually in the next month. So, as I mentioned, you can see the structure over there on the right. Um, five teams underway at the same time for one year. Um, and then from there, starting in June, we'll be participating in a multi-month <laughs> um, review process where we'll select down to up to three teams into the next phase. And that next phase will focus mostly on environmental compliance. From there, we'll select one team with an associated site, and that team will then begin to initiate, uh, once permits are in hand, obviously permitting is, is very significant, um, initiate subsurface characterization um, and, and then in partnership with DOE, in tandem with DOE, with our community, we will then be able to implement an EGS roadmap. And so this roadmap will be include drilling of monitoring wells, drilling of injection production wells, testing stimulation technologies, testing R&D um, of all forms associated with and working towards the goal of, of really understanding um, how to create reservoirs and how to sustain reservoirs. So now I'll move on to the hydrothermal program. I mentioned the Play Fairway initiative, and this is a technique as obviously um, that's been adapted from oil and gas. It's based on essentially applying innovative analysis um, of existing and essentially extracting new data from existing data sets. Um, also sort of trying to couple multiple data types to identify exploration prospects. And so here we're working to find undiscovered resources, whether they're low temperature, hydrothermal, or EGS, and reduce the risk that's associated with exploration. So this this effort focuses on a regional scale, so very large scale, and we're looking at un undiscovered or, or essentially um, areas that are unexplored in the United States. So we selected 11 projects back in 2014 that we're working to um, develop risk analyses, uncertainty models, and then develop a comprehensive maps of these regions um, and uh, to highlight the areas that they think were best for exploration. And then just at the end of last year, we selected six of those 11 projects to move forward into an additional phase where they're actually um, working to high grade uh, via additional field work potential areas for future drilling. So this is a very exciting initiative under the hydrothermal program. The other major part of only the sites you can see sort of that, that have been selected to move forward. The other part of the hydrothermal program I mentioned is the subsurface engineering crosscut or subter. And the goal here is is essentially um, solving challenges associated with the subsurface. How do we control the subsurface? And how can we leverage the experiences of all of the other offices within DOE and the other subsurface energy technologies out there? So fossil, nuclear, geothermal, um, we're working with our office of science as well. So the theme, as I mentioned, we execute over these four these four pillars, we call them, or technology areas that you can see listed at the top. Um, last year, we issued a FOA, or a funding opportunity, in combination with our fossil program across these pillars. And this year, we have something open right now, looking for applications to look at subsurface uh, signals and how essentially how to image the subsurface. And that closes in, in April. So now the low temperature program. Um, 
the new initiative in, in low temperature is mineral recovery, which is very exciting. So in 2014, um, they kicked off this new effort. It's focused on coupling mineral extraction and power production. And so obviously there are some significant benefits to doing that. Um, critical materials have high value and we require critical materials or, or um, essentially um, for, for many of the US manufacturing processes, especially renewable energy processes. Um, also, there's increased oper operational efficiencies that can come from um, removing some minerals from, from um, our brines in terms of reducing scaling and, and also uh, corrosion issues. So in 2014, we had nine projects selected to sort of do a basic overall assessment of um, potential technologies for mineral extraction. And then our program just issued and closed another opportunity to move this forward into another phase where we're looking looking more specifically of how to leverage technologies from other industries on surface, ex surface extraction technologies and subsurface, as well as uh, performing an overall assessment of the, the actual resource that exists in geothermal brines in the United States. Um, Another, another new part of the low temperature program, which is extremely relevant to this, um, to this audience and this conference, is the potential to develop um, direct use, something that we haven't done before within our program. So our office is exploring the possibility of using deep wells um, for large scale heating and cooling for universities, for um, you know, zero emission campuses, uh, hospital systems, uh, businesses, and, and so on. And so as evidenced by what's happening um, and, and clearly the successes in Iceland and, and all over Europe, this would not only be, uh, you know, provide a significant cost savings for American businesses and families, but it also gives us the opportunity to expand the reach and impact of geothermal technologies, which is very attractive, I think, at, the, at this point. So finally, I'll cover the systems analysis program. Um, the vision study is a priority initiative here. And, and when I say vision, I think that this is, this is very apt because you know, often geothermal is, is the invisible renewable energy. We need a vision, especially in the United States, on how to move geothermal forward. So our office started this study last year with the intent of engaging and, um, and assembling a new community, new stakeholders on, on the myriad benefits of geothermal technologies across our market segments. So not just electricity production, but non-electric as well. Um, so we're also looking to show how geothermal can provide as a, as a clean baseload technology um, in our future. And we're hoping that this comprehensive view of the potential of geothermal will, will um, inspire the, the communities or communities in the United States and the public to advocate for geothermal more readily um, in the future. So I want to close by thanking our very gracious hosts but for organizing um, this very, very informative and inspiring meeting. Um, I want to reiterate the fact that to achieve an energy future that is what we want, that's accessible, that is affordable, reliable, environmentally responsible. We need policies, but we also need technology innovation. And at DOE, we're very excited for the opportunity to be working, working towards this um, and very committed, especially in the geothermal space, to seeing um, a tangible change in our power sector. But that being said, community and collaboration is absolutely critical. So we're very interested and excited to engage and assemble both the domestic and international community to leverage each other's work and learn from each other to make sure that we see an impact in the development and, and a growth of all aspects of the, of the geothermal sector. So thank you very much.